truth, and they chose Stephen, the man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Lycanor, and Timon, and, and Barmen, and Nicolas, a proselyte of Antioch from the seventy fourth the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, note, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Let's pray. Our God bless now the word in these few minutes we have together here, that the name of Christ may be honored and glorified, and we may be challenged again from thy word to be faithful to the work thou hast called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If I would choose a text from the reading today, it would be verse 4, and we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. We we'll give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. That's the preacher's work. That is his work. Prayer and the ministry of the Word. Now, of necessity, we become many things. We become business administrators. We become administrators of Christian schools, which I am. Uh, presidents of college, chancellor of colleges. And we have the church to take care of as many ministries, the financial difficulties and battles, the family problems. The, we, we become counselors and, and administrators and mathematicians and business people. And we get involved in the battles of fellowships and differences and all the Bible and all many of these things very important and very, very necessary. We have to. We have to keep up with what's happening in the world. But, preacher, never forget your ministry, my ministry, is prayer. This whole book. Amen. Now, that's, that's got to be it. We may Amen. have to be, we'll call, be called upon to do many, many things, but never neglect prayer and the Word. We're to be preachers of the Word ministers of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and people who are sold out to the prayer, life, and the ministry of the word till we see Jesus face to face. And now that the apostle said we will give ourselves, that's dedication. We will give ourselves. We will give ourselves to the ministry, or continually rather, to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That's dedication to a calling. Surrender that we will give ourselves completely to our Lord and prayer and the ministry of the word of God. That takes concentration. The statement of the apostle Paul, this one thing I do. Now Paul traveled many miles by ship by walking, by horseback perhaps, by many, many means of travel. And he was a man of great wisdom, given him of God. At all times he was an administrator. He'd be a pastor until another pastor was called. He would deal with preachers and churches with their problems. He was a writer and author. He was often a prisoner. He was many things. But this one thing I do, he said, and if you would sum it up, it would have been prayer and ministry of the Word of God. I know that people look at Brother Cummins. Let's see Brother Folger here. We have a lot of things in common. He has resigned the pastor in Mansfield Baptist Temple after many years of faithful ministry and service there. He said it's busier, busier than he's ever been. He doesn't have the load of the pastor any longer. I hate to confess this, but my next birthday in July, I'll be the right old age of 71 years of age. Now, I know you have to find that hard to believe, but that's, that's true. You can check up with my wife. Reach the age of 71. And uh, next November, this coming November, on the 19th, which will be our 45th anniversary of the Massillon Baptist Temple. And my 45th anniversary of the pastorate, founding pastor of the Massillon Baptist Temple, 
I am tendering my resignation. We have a young man in training, been with us about two years now, I believe. Brother Mark Jacobs, one of our graduates, worked on the staff for a few years after he graduated. Went back to work with us about two years ago, and a fine young preacher, and doing a, a good job, and seems to be accepted by the people, and everything looks like it's going right along schedule, and it's going to be a traumatic experience for me, and perhaps even more so for my wife, to step out of the pasture for all of those years. Brother well, Estes knows something about that, and this is Estes. And it's something we feel God would lead us to do, but it is a really a traumatic experience. I plan to stay busy. Someone asked me the other day, what are you going to do when you retire? I said, first of all, I'm not retiring. I'm resigning. <laughs> Preachers never retire. Right. They resign from the pastorate or a position. But God called me. He didn't say, I'll call you until you're 71 years old, and then you step out. He called me as long as I can walk and talk and speak and preach and study the Bible. Amen. And someone said, what are you going to do when you step out of the pulpit? I said, keep on preaching. Uh, Amen. Where the door opens, just keep on preaching. I'm a poet also. I write a few poems, like our brother said, he did, and I quote those of others. And this is not mine, but listen. I really don't mind growing old. Most people who notice are kind. My hearing aid, dentures, and bifocals work well, but what I miss most is my mind. <laughs> I think it was Brother George Norris who said to his wife when he was in his ripe old age of early 50s years ago, he said, honey, I just can't remember like I used to. And she quickly said, but honey, you never could. <laughs> Are we busy 
practicing that. I'm talking about the, uh, the prayer that we talked about, just mentioned briefly last evening in Acts chapter 4, and I quoted a portion of this from Acts chapter 4 and verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And note, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but that all things common, in verse 33, and with great power, great power, Great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace, amen, was upon them all. Great power, great grace, because of great prayer. Pray. Someone said, much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little power. No prayer, no power. Now, I am not theologically inclined, I'm not the great theologian, to separate God's sovereignty and man's obedience to the will of God, but I'm simply saying that every preacher in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, accomplished what they accomplished through prayer and the Word of God. And they prayed. And of course, we study the Word of God and plan of God, and regardless of God's part in it, and he is a sovereign God, no question about it, he answers the prayers of his preachers and people when they humbly, repentantly fall on their face before him and pray. Pray. Prayer meetings such as that in Acts 4, home shaking, town, city shaking, church shaking, prayer meetings, praying like Peter and praying like Paul and even as our Lord Jesus Christ, who was up early in the morning and prayed, remember, and spent all nights in prayer, remember, and prayed momentarily talking to his heavenly Father, just speak to his heavenly Father, and the Father would answer from heaven, praying when he was baptized, praying throughout his ministry, praying while on the cross, still at the right hand of the Father, praying. Yeah. He ever liveth to make intercession for you, for me. We understand so little about the matter of prayer, don't we? Why would the Lord Jesus Christ need to pray? He was God in the flesh. He performed the miracles, multiplied the fish and loaves, sealed the stormy seas, raised the dead back to life, unstopped the deaf ears, opened the blinded eyes that they could see. He was a miracle working God in the flesh. And yet we find him on his face in prayer, praying in the garden before Calvary until great drops of blood fell to the ground, the perspiration turning to blood. If Jesus needed to pray as he prayed in his lifetime with a life that was so ordained before the foundation of the world that he would walk in strict obedience to the Heavenly Father's will, to the cross of Calvary, and through death, hell, the grave, and be raised triumphantly on the third day. I say that he needed to pray. How in the world do we think that we can get by without prayer? Mystery? Yes. Filled with promises? Yes. Study the Word of God and the prayers of the Old Testament saints and of the New Testament saints. I find some 200 of them recorded actually worded prayers of the Word of God. Other many times, many, many times he speaks of their praying and what they prayed about. But 200 recorded prayers that you read what they prayed, their words. This book is a book that one said, if you would cut it on any page, it will read. It tells the story of the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ in Genesis through the Revelation. It tells us the way to heaven. It's a precious book. But this tells us that there was a day when the people of God began to pray. And we find them praying from Genesis all the way through the Old Testament, the New Testament, and even in heaven. Seeing the praises of the Lord and the saints of God cry out in prayer, How long, O Lord, how long will us avenge our blood on those on the earth? A little while longer. I have no idea what matter of prayer they pray in the part of eternity to come out 
there after the time of the coming of Christ, the millennial reign, the making of all things new, and we're out in eternity. I have no idea. The Bible doesn't say anything about it, so I certainly won't. But I know now, in the day of grace, in the day of the church, God's people need to be people of prayer. I made a statement one time. I thought it was a profound statement. I liked it so well, somewhere in my Bible, in the study of prayer, I pinned in the margin or fly leaf of my Bible. Anything that God has ever done for his people, he has done in answer to their prayers. I thought, that's great. Why well, wrote that down? I, I have a little, I guess I put BDC, that's Bruce D. Cummins. I wrote the fly leaf, or rather on the margin of the Bible text somewhere, I don't know where it is right now, but anything that God has ever done for his people of any day at any time, as far as that's concerned, he has done in answer to prayer. Well, I thought that was profound. I preached on that. One day I was reading a book written by John Wesley, and John Wesley said, Anything that God has ever done for his people at any time, he has done that in answer to their prayers. I said, Amen, Brother Wesley. Great minds run together. <laughs> he probably said it first. <laughs> and I probably read it, and this dumb, mixed up computer brain of mine and filed it away, and it came out. I thought it was mine, you know. I should have known better. I should have Charles Finney said, Preacher, every time you go to the pulpit, be full of prayer. Whenever you attempt to preach, be full of prayer. Are we? No matter, preacher. Martin Luther said, Unless I spend two hours in prayer each morning, the devil gets the day. <clears throat> about that one. Men, and I, you know these, I could quote and give the accounts of praying preachers of the gospel who spent hours, sometimes days, alone in prayer, fasting in prayer, that the power of God may rest upon them. Prayer. And then the preaching of the Word of God. For some years I taught pastoral theology along with some other subjects in our college in Massillon. And I tried to instill into the hearts of our young preachers that when they get up, now illustrations are good and they are necessary and all of us use them. Jesus used them. Nothing wrong with stories and illustrations that fit. Nothing wrong with that at all. But I would challenge them again and again from 2 Timothy 4, preach the word. Preach the word. Amen. Preach. Amen. Amen. Spurgeon used to say that man wasn't called to preach unless he could speak to an auditorium of 10,000 people without a microphone. <laughs> you had to have a booming voice and let it could be heard inside the building and outside the building and in the sinners across the street. I don't think I'm picking on anyone, first in particular. <laughs> will not get the job done. Yeah. We're to sound off like a trumpet. You hear a trumpet? I preached on the second coming of Christ one time, I preached on it several times. There's one time I had a young man uh, with a trumpet. And at the appropriate time, the trumpet sound, he blasted out. He woke up! <laughs> He used to tell me that if people went to sleep in the pew, wake up the preacher in the pulpit. Amen. Preach! We're dealing with eternal issues. Amen. Preach on hell, we have to make it so real that people can feel and understand and sympathize with those who are burning in hell so they can smell the fire and brimstone. Preach on heaven, we ought to lead them to the place where they can see the streets of gold and the gates of pearl and the redeemed of the ages gathering there and the multitudes with their orchestras and bands and voices of the redeemed of all lands and all parts of the world singing, Thou art worthy, O Lamb. Amen. Make them homesick for heaven. Don't apologize. 
apologize for the word of God. Amen. Get up and declare it in no uncertain terms. Preach what God called you to do. Brother said a while ago, I've been saved 40 years. I think was that correct? I think I had that right. At 71, I've been saved for 60 years. Amen. It was called somewhere between 48 and 49 years ago, 50 years ago. Graduate of Bible College, preached on street corners, hopeless <coughs> when they'd let me supply. Started the ministry of the Master and Baptist Temple. I taught Sunday school at 10 and preached at 11 and preached at 7 and preached at 7.30. Wednesday evening, 7.30. Grew from 22 to 50 to over 100 in nine months. Pitched a tent on the early, the, the first piece of property we purchased. It bought from land contract. Had the privilege of putting up a tent there. Dr. Dallas Billington loaned me the tent. God sent an old ex-carnival circus man to keep the thing up, keep it patched and sewed together. Had a first revival. Over 30 people saved. Had a baptismal service in the reservoir. I've been preaching ever since then. Amen. Someone called and said, uh, will you preach? I said, yeah, where or when? Is that some sick? Well, maybe. <laughs> I have a little book that I've kept the record of over 400 now revival meetings and missions conferences and soul winning clinics and, and uh, whatever. You say you're bragging? God forbid. But God called me to preach. Resignation doesn't mean I resign from the ministry. I resign a pulpit, the pastorate. Become an itinerant evangelist and revivalist and preacher. Told my people that if necessary, I'd go out in the middle of the field and find me a stump and preach to the cows. And that may be it someday. I don't know, but I'll find old Moo and preach to her. <laughs> preach! Get up and say, thus said the Lord in uncertain terms. This is God's word. We give ourselves to a ministry of prayer and the word. Read it and read it and reread it and study it through and mark its pages and build your sermon outlines and whatever you do when you stand up to preach. Preach, I think, one of the greatest weaknesses of fundamental churches across America today is the weakness of the pulpit. Right. Right. Preach against sin. Name it. Preach on righteousness and holiness and grace and the judgment of God and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Preach it! Never apologize for it. Get up and preach. Had an evangelist with us a few years ago and he said he was driving down the highway and he turned on the radio and heard an old country preacher and there's not a thing wrong with country preachers. I was born and raised in West Virginia and worked on the farms and country boy. Many great men of God were simply full country preachers. But he heard this old country preachers, this old country preacher saying, Now we're going to be at such and such a church. We're going to begin there on Sunday night and go through the Friday night in an old fashioned, pathetic Bible conference. <laughs> <laughs> and two or three times he said pathetic instead of prophetic, and maybe he was right. So <laughs> Some of them got pretty pathetic. I don't know where this came from. A mist in the pulpit becomes a fog in the view. There are those who sample sermons. Captain Joseph G. Way stated, there's the cotton candy sermon, very sweet and full of air, when bitten into, nothing there. The stuffed olive sermon, pleasantly fashioned, pleasing, fashion, pleasingly tart. Stuck with intellect, but no heart. The jello fruit salad sermon. Shaking, prancing, quivering, preaching, lots of action, but no calorie teaching. <laughs> There's the poached egg sermon. Soft, safe, sentimental food. Soothes every mind and calms every mood. There's the left 
overtook you, servant. Meet this suspect you served before. <laughs> but despise just enough for one Sunday morning. There was a strawberry and whipped cream sermon. A summer surprise. Memorably bright, light and wake, but what a delight. And then the roast beef and potato sermon. Familiar fare, but always good. The gospel preached in words understood. What makes the difference? The preaching of the word of God? Outline, preparation, illustration, laugh here, cry here. <laughs> All flat. What makes the difference? Prayer. The power of the Holy Spirit of God. We've been talking about revival and the call to prayer. There is a difference, you know, between evangelism and revival. Evangelism is soul winning, evangelism is knocking on doors, evangelism is witnessing. One said evangelism is presenting the word of God to people where they are, that's good. Getting the gospel out. Do you know that you can have evangelism without the Bible? I speak in soul winning conferences, being one or two weeks from now. I'm not opposed to that in any sense of the word, but do you know that an unsaved man can take that little book and those instructions and just follow down the line? and get someone to say yes. That's evangelism. I'm for evangelism. I'm getting people saved. I'm for evangelism. But no, but revival is something entirely different. Revival is hearing the sob of a Christ upon the cross of Calvary. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Looking upon the multitudes with compassion, tenderness, and tears. Revival is an echo of the heart of God through a surrendered soul who weeps for sinners, weepingly bringing them to Christ. Amen. Revival is a new touch from the hand of God. Sale ministry for a dying church. Someone said revival is simply a new obedience to God, doing what we know He wants us to do praying, reading our Bibles, preaching the Word, telling others of Christ. Someone said revival is a mighty movement of the Holy Spirit of God among God's people, resulting in Christians getting right with God, with one another place of repentance, which you don't hear much preaching about. And restitution, making things right with the wounded brother, paying your bills, making things right. Forgiveness. Wrongs <coughs> made right, churches meeting for one sole purpose of worshiping God, getting instruction from His hand. Real revival will result in genuine evangelism. Saw some a great forward thrust of souls one to Christ. Revival produces biblical evangelism. I'm of the opinion if we do not have revival, we best go ahead and give it our best in evangelism anyway. Amen. We're commanded to do that. We're commanded to take the gospel into all the world. How much better it is to go to a revived spirit and a revived heart Amen. of the power of the Holy Spirit Amen. of God Amen. to present the message of the gospel of Christ one on one or from a pulpit filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. It says it's about time to quit and eat. I knew a Scottish evangelist by the name of Jock Truth. Came to Bible Baptist Seminary present for just a short time told the story of living in a little fishing village with about 500 people, unsaved, lost. The man led him to Christ. 
He was so thrilled with his newfound faith in Christ, he went back to that little fishing village to endeavor to win his friends, family, loved ones to the war. He would go talk to them about what had happened to him, knew very little about the Bible or anything else, just got saved and he wanted them to be saved. They laughed at it, they reminded him how rough he was before he quote, got saved, and how his language had been so bad, told him what all he knew all of that. After about a week, he was so terribly discouraged. There was a little empty fishing shack, a little place where fishing would stay during this fishing run for seasons. He went in there and got on his face before God with an open Bible and said, God, I don't know much about the book. I know you're saved. I'm trying to tell my family, friends, and loved ones about Jesus. They won't listen. God, I can't stand this. I think I'll die if I can't win my own loved ones to Christ. He began to pray, cry out to God. He said for three days, he wept, prayed, fasted. And he went out into that little fishing village and he said, I would simply take hold of a person's hand and start telling them about Jesus. And they'd break down and cry. Man. And in a few weeks, an entire fishing village of 500 souls were born into the family of God. Now, move up one of the sovereignty or anything else that you want to, but it came from a broken hearted man who wept Amen. before God. Amen. God heard him. I'm not a job truth. I'm a sinner saved by God's grace. I can challenge people to a life of prayer and preaching the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. I will be satisfied. You can forget my name altogether. At this temple was born in the spirit of prayer, midnight prayer meetings, some all night prayer meetings. It has been marked down through the years with the revivals and tent revivals and preaching times and prayer meetings with a little of God. I would pour out my heart to him. A few years ago, in a very desperate time in our ministry, financially, we were in bad trouble. Problems in the church, disgruntled people. I said in a deacon's meeting, we had a dinner together. I said, if I had a place just to go away, where there's no television, no radio, no telephone, no people. Just get on. I don't want to go to a motel. They can find you there. The telephone's there. People come knock on the door. want to clean the room all. I said, someone just, someone just go away. After the meeting, one of our men came to me, one of our deacons, and said, my wife's family has a little cottage down in Leesville Lake. You can have it if you like, as long as you want it. I set a time in March. He led me down there. I could never have found it by myself, though I'm used to leave the lake. There used to be some fishing there, but this is around the other side, the wooded area. <coughs> there was a little, small, two-room cottage, open fireplace. Carried the water from a spring outside, very crude. I took on some crackers, cheese, apples, very common fare. Took the Bible. I took a cassette player, but I took with me New Testament on cassette that I'd recorded some years before and a couple of good, solid gospel music tapes or hymns. That's all. They left me there, I'm sure. When they left me there, he thought he left one person there, but he really left three. I was there, certainly the Lord was there because he's promised never to leave me or forsake me. It seemed that the devil was there too. Times when you're discouraged and almost ready to say, what's the use? No way out! For three days in that little cabin on Leesville Lake, I prayed, I read my Bible, I listened to the cassette music, I fasted, I'd perhaps have an apple and some cheese and cracker for breakfast and forget it till next day at breakfast time. I prayed. March was a lovely time of year that year. I took long walks in the woods. After
after about the third day, praying, no telephone, no radios, no peoples, no television. Just alone with the Lord. There were only two of us left in that camp. Hey, hey, hey. The devil can't stand it when he sees people on their knees crying out to God, Oh God, I must have that blessing. I cannot go on alone. Somewhere along the way, the devil left. And I walked the floor and I said, Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you for hearing and answering prayer. Thank you for your blessing. And I rejoiced in the Lord. I began to pack everything back up to the old station wagon, headed back to my school. Here we are, 45 years. I haven't lost the glory yet. Amen. Look forward to preaching every opportunity I have. Get away from the pulpit and want to get back and preach to those people again. Lord's been good to me. He keeps this old body working and this old heart pumping and keeps me able to speak and preach. And I said last night, somewhere, somewhere till Jesus comes, I'll be standing proclaiming the word of God, telling people that God is real and Christ is real and He'll save souls and He'll revive Christians and churches and we can have revival in our churches and we can have revival sweep America again. I believe with all the heart. Because they believe in this old book. Preach. Pray. That's our ministry. Let's stand, please. Why don't we thank thee for this blessed old book? You've given us a commission that will last until we step on the shores of heaven. To pray. To preach. To tell others of Christ. To evangelize. Send the message around the world. Keep us faithful until we see our blessed Savior one day, face to face. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Amen.